March 1979. 18 months and half a billion miles from home, Voyager 1 is preparing to meet the Lord of the Planets. Jupiter's size is hard to imagine. 11 Earths could line up across its diameter. It has twice as much matter as all of the other planets put together. More than a thousand Earths could fit inside. Jupiter is almost entirely made up of hydrogen and helium gas. The swirling colors come from the small amounts of sulfur, oxygen, carbon and nitrogen compounds. There is no real surface here, nothing to stand up on, just an immense deep atmosphere. Clouds under clouds getting thicker and hotter for thousands upon thousands of miles. The most intriguing feature that's visible on the surface is the great red spot, three times as wide as the Earth. It was first observed by the astronomer Giovanni Cassini more than 300 years ago. How can it have lasted so long? In fact, what we see are these different islands of color which persist sometimes for hundreds of years. And this is a very amazing thing and very difficult to explain. Why should these fluid features exist for so long in the presence of all this turbulence, really? This movie shows motion around the red spot. You can see, for instance, spots coming over the top of the red spot, some going off to the west, some going off to the east. You can see this very turbulent region to the west of the red spot. You can see a flow down below the red spot that actually changes, reverses direction. The existence of this very turbulent region so close to such a permanent weather feature as the red spot is very hard for me to understand. But this computer simulation suggested an answer. It shows what happens when bands of fluids move past each other, riding over bumps. On Jupiter, there's no surface, but the pressure under the clouds must be uneven, like a washboard. The simulation shows that eddies form and slowly start to merge. In the course of millions of years, the smaller ones are eaten up. This is the surviving predator. It looks something like a hurricane, only bigger. But the Earth's weather comes from a different source of energy than Jupiter's. Our weather is powered by the sun. On Jupiter, the sun is much weaker, but heat pours out from the planet's hot interior, which is still cooling off from the days when Jupiter was formed. One of the differences between Jupiter weather and the Earth is that uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter is continuous with a fluid interior and also there's an internal heat source uh, on Jupiter and not on the Earth. Now Professor Busa of UCLA has a laboratory experiment where he takes a spherical container, puts it on a rotating platform and heats it from within. Naturally, convection currents form, but because of the rotation, these currents are arranged in long, thin columns. Some of us think that this is what's going on on Jupiter, and that this difference between Jupiter and the Earth is very important for understanding Jupiter weather. Perhaps Jupiter's vivid bands are just the ends of cylinders which reach all the way through the planet. The Voyagers also visited all four of Jupiter's big moons, most of which are made of rock surrounded by thick layers of ice. These were the best photos of the moons taken from Earth telescopes. When the Voyager cameras arrived, their sharp focus revealed a history book of the solar system. Chapter 1, Callisto, the outermost moon about the size of the planet Mercury. Callisto is densely pockmarked with craters. This computer-enhanced view shows them completely covering the moon. 
scientists concluded that this surface must date back to the very beginning of the solar system. The theory is that a disk of gas and dust condensed into the sun, the planets and the moons about four and a half billion years ago. In those early days, the solar system was full of flying debris and all the planets and moons were subjected to intense bombardment. This is Meteor Crater, Arizona. It's one of the rare impact craters we find on the Earth. There are, of course, many, many other craters that have been formed on the Earth and have been either eroded away or covered up by sediments. And it's only the youngest that are preserved, such as this one, which was formed about 25,000 years ago. Now, we're interested in these craters primarily uh, because it provides us a tool for dating surfaces on the other planets and on the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. To find a surface that is chock full of craters, we must be looking at a surface that is very ancient. In fact, we must be going back to that point in time in which the rate of cratering was much higher than it is today. A time in which the pieces from which the planets themselves were built were still being swept out of the region around the planets. The birth of today's planetary system was anything but peaceful. Bodies of all sizes were constantly crashing into the developing planets and moons. Callisto's scarred face seems to scream out this violent story. Ganymede, the next moon in toward Jupiter, was harder to interpret but it seems to represent chapter two in the history of the solar system. This moon has patches that look like Callisto, but it also has areas marked by grooves where there aren't many craters. Something happened here to erase the first craters. What was it? And why didn't it happen to Callisto? Perhaps some future explorer will give us the answer. Chapter 3, Europa. Here, all the early craters have been erased, and the surface is smooth, except for giant cracks. Unlike Ganymede and Callisto, in which we see uh, uh, dense populations of impact craters on, on the icy surfaces, on the icy surface of Europa, we see virtually no impact record. Evidently, Europa had to remain young and active uh, beyond the period of the torrential bombardment so that its surface was continually being renewed. Instead what we see are a, a complex network of intersecting uh, dark bands and they're thought to have resulted from the expansion of, of Europa as the ocean froze. Europa looks very much like the cracked ice of the Earth's polar regions. This is Antarctica as seen from space. Europa just has more color. If the three outer moons tell the region's history, Io, the inner moon, turned out to be a lesson in current events. Its orange surface seems covered in hot, broken blisters caused by volcanoes, not meteorites. Studying Io, a young scientist made a remarkable discovery. I was doing my job of optical navigation and looking at pictures of the satellites of Jupiter and stars to tell us where the spacecraft was. I expected to see the satellite Io and two stars in the frame. I noticed the appearance right off the limb of Io of an anomalous crescent. I have determined the latitude and longitude in the region of this crescent on the surface of Io. This turned out to be the latitude and longitude of a large heart-shaped feature on Io, already known to be a volcanic feature, but of course not ever believed to have been an active volcano. I concluded that what we were definitely witnessing was an active volcanic eruption and that the crescent itself was a volcanic plume, a dust cloud of gas, an actual volcanic eruption the first ever witnessed on a body other than the Earth in our solar system. The other bright spot down there is also another volcanic eruption. 
what we are observing here in the discovery frame was in fact two simultaneous volcanic eruptions. The surface of Io is incredibly active, much more active volcanically than even the Earth. We found out that not only was Io's surface being modified by volcanic processes, it was being done so literally in front of our eyes. There were active volcanoes going off at the time we were there with Voyager 1, at least uh, seven or eight, uh, perhaps nine, clearly identified uh, uh, explosive volcanic eruptions, throwing materials uh, hundreds of kilometers above Io's surface in the force of the eruptions. Uh, this uh, uh, picture shows two different uh, volcanoes which are seen from several different angles to give some perspective. Here we see ejecta coming out from uh, the center of the, the volcano and falling back down to the surface. Here we see it lit against back uh, black sky so that the symmetrical form of the eruption, much like a sprinkler head, uh, and that's throwing material up approximately 70, 80 kilometers in that view. We estimate that this continual resurfacing of Io amounts to spreading a, a layer or blanket of volcanic material of about a millimeter uh, thickness over the entire planet every year. Now that rate, if it continued over geologic time, would amount to essentially turning Io inside out. Io's tortured activity is probably caused by its position, locked by gravity between giant Jupiter and the other moons. Powerful tides stretch and pull Io so hard that its interior melts and boils, spewing sulfur out onto the surface like hellfire in space. The Voyager scientists believe sulfur accounts for all of Io's bright colors. We'll start out with the simple kind of sulfur you'd buy from your pharmacist called flower sulfur. It's simply yellow uh, sulfur. As a matter of fact, on Io, at very, very cold temperatures, this yellow sulfur is, uh, is virtually white. What we'll do is uh, heat this gradually now you can see the color starting to uh, slowly change. This is the next form. It's an orange form of sulfur. If we were to cool this uh, very rapidly, this sulfur would uh, retain its color. As the sulfur uh, continues to change, it becomes redder and very liquid. So. Some of the uh, flows that we see on Io, which are orange and red, suggest that this, this very runny form of sulfur froze, retaining the color. As we go to higher temperature now, the sulfur changes again to a deep red and becomes much more viscous, like syrup. It runs much uh, more slowly across the surface, forming cliffs on the flow front. And then the highest form, you can start to see here changing, is a uh, virtually a brown to black form. It's this form of sulfur we see on the black spots that are scattered around on the floors of the calderas on Io. Suggests that the materials on, on the floors were heated to much higher temperatures, in this case about uh, 300 degrees centigrade. Some of the erupting sulfur escapes Io altogether and is trapped by Jupiter's powerful magnetic field, 13 times as strong as the Earth's. The sulfur winds up as a donut of electrically charged sulfur gas, with Io orbiting inside. Voyager recorded this sound of radio waves generated by the sulfur trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field. The field generates an electric current of three million amperes, which flows between the moon and the planet. Voyager also discovered a delicate ring around Jupiter, much too faint to be seen from Earth. Here, it is backlit by the sun, a preview of the next stop on humanity's grandest tour ever. As Jupiter swung the voyagers around, its immense gravity sped them up as much as the Titan rockets that had launched them. In the process, Jupiter actually slowed down on its course around the sun about three feet every trillion years.